this morning, turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, let me just apologize to you right from the beginning. We're going back old school today. I have been so busy and so much running with my work in Rwanda this week, plus coming back and going right to the funeral yesterday. I just did not have time to do a PowerPoint and put all that together. So you're going to have to take your own notes today. So get your paper out, get your Bibles out, get your work out. I haven't done all the work for you this time. Uh, you're going to have to work, and that's good for us as well. So get your Bibles, turn to the book of Genesis. Real easy one to find. It's only a few pages in. We're going to start a series of messages today. And over the next six to seven weeks, maybe a little bit longer than that, because we do have a few visitors coming in that will be visiting during this time, we're going to be talking about the, 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 the oh, let's see, let me, I lost it there. We're going to be talking about how God desires to have relationship with us. Amen. That God doesn't want to be this, this uh, uh, magnificent uh, king that sits on a throne out in some throne room in some celestial city, but God truly wants to be a part of our lives. He wants to be in relationship. And uh, many of our pastoral staff are going to be uh, taking topics on this. Uh, uh, we're going to be talking about God is, God, what? The senses of God. God, the senses of God, that God sees, God hears, God touches or God feels, God speaks. Uh, and there's one other one, uh, smells, God, God smells. Uh, and you say, God smells. Uh, not that he, he himself smells, but he smells our worship. Uh, he smells our worship uh, that we offer up to him. It says our worship is a, a clean-smelling, uh, is a, Jesus help me today, I'm having trouble. It's a sweet-smelling aroma in the nostrils of the Lord. Oh, my goodness. You can tell I'm not quite on my game today. Uh, but I hope I've got a message. So today, my, and my wife gave us, she, she's the one that asked if we could do this series. And she gave me the topic of starting this off and talking about how God wants to be in relationship with us. So let's, uh, I'm going to do my best to cover that topic in the next. I, I know it's already 10 to 12. But let's see what God will help us to do this morning. Genesis chapter 3. Let's just read verses 8 and 9. And then we're going to read a small portion out of the book of Exodus. Then the man and his wife. We know that is speaking of Adam and Eve. Heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man. Where are you? But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And then over in the book of Exodus, if you just flip over to the book of Exodus, another short passage of scripture, Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Exodus 3, verses 14 and 15. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And God said, also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Powerful scripture there. Father, bless the reading of your word today. And as we begin to lay the groundwork for this sermon topic on relationship. Father, help us to know that you have never desired to be in a religious relationship with your people. Actually, just that term, God, we know connotates something that, that doesn't even mean relationship at all but you truly want to be in an intimate close relationship with your children just like a good father on earth is with his children and pray that we would be able to see that and understand it as we we do these teaching today and over the next weeks that we would be able to relate to ourselves and to one another that almighty god 
the God of the universe desires to be my friend and desires to know my hurts and desires to be a part of my life. And may we be able to communicate that uniquely, creatively, but also in simplistic ways that it would touch our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Bible, I had this written down, then I changed it just a little bit. I had it written down. The main theme of the Bible is about God's relationship with man. And it is, and I really believe that, but just so I don't tie myself into a corner that maybe I, I went back and I put in front of that one of the main themes. Because there are several themes that go from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. But one of the main themes, if not maybe the, the main above all the other main themes, is that God is constantly in a pursuit of a relationship with his creation, with mankind. And we see it here in the book of Genesis, and I'm going to get back that, to that in a moment. But God wants that relationship that was lost ultimately in the Garden of Eden, he has strived and uh, maybe he, I should probably say he has strove. Which way am I supposed to say that? He has striven. Sharon says striven. That don't sound right. I, I don't know which one it is, but he's done one of those things so that he could be with us. It's been his desire to be with us, to be a part of our lives. And he wants to do that. And uh, as we get into these subjects today, and then we get into this subject today, and I hope the next weeks people will kind of pick up on this as they talk about their senses, that God has always wanted us to have relationship. Satan has always wanted to come in and divide and despoil that relationship. Right from the beginning, the story, and we'll get to that in a moment, his plan was to steal, to kill, and destroy. And right from the very beginning, when Satan comes on the scene, the first thing he does, he goes in and he divides and he destroys and he rips apart the relationship that man has with God. And that's kind of the theme. We see that going back and forth in the Bible. And the whole purpose of Jesus Christ coming in the flesh was that God loved the world so much that he sent Jesus Christ into the world to redeem that relationship between him and man. So that religion no longer had to be the catalyst for man to reach God. But now relationship with Jesus Christ became our access to come into God's Amen. presence. Amen. Amen. That was pretty good. That's not even in my notes. That, was, that just kind of came out by the Holy Spirit, I think. Did you get that on the notes? Yeah. Good. Thank you, ma'am. Right. <laughs> she's learning what things she's supposed to cut out and what things she's supposed to leave so that it doesn't get out into the, to the cyber world. I, I'm joking. I hope you know that. I'm joking. So Satan wants to divide, dilute, confuse our relationship. But God is constantly wanting to come in and renew, restore, and even enhance our relationship that it becomes greater and greater. The same, that's the same thing that's supposed to happen between us as people. Well, our relationships are not supposed to grow apart. Our relationships are supposed to grow together, especially husbands and wives. We're supposed to get closer together, get more related together. We get to a point that some people say that we know what we're thinking, I know what my wife's thinking. I know what my husband's thinking. I think any man that's ever said that knows he's telling a lie because no man knows what a woman's thinking. Uh, but I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, I, I just do that to keep you awake. I saw several of you nodding, so I, I throw a joke in there every once in a while. But, but we know those things and we do those things uh, in relationship. It's supposed to be that way. A.W. Tozier, who's a great Christian writer, he, he said this about relationship. He said, our relationship with God depends greatly upon our concept of who God is. Amen. If we have a negative or wrong concept of who God is, that will determine our relationship with God. If we see God as this as this mean, mighty ogre that's constantly on the lookout for us to, to, to do wrong and to, to sin so that he can squash us with a hammer and throw us into the pits of hell, then that's the concept or the relationship we're going to have with God. 
But we can also go the other way, or the other spectrum, and we can think God's like this, this uh, sugar daddy that anything I want, I just say, okay, God, give me this, and it's mine. I can name it and claim it, and I can blab it and grab it, and I can have everything I want. All I've got to say is, oh, God, it's me, your child. Give it to me. Because many earthly fathers have become that way because they want their kids to love them. But really, they don't love you. They're using you. The Bible says if you love your child, you will give them good gifts, but you'll also discipline them. Yes. And you don't give them everything they always want. And God doesn't do that for us. But we sometimes we have that concept of God that if I say it and if I pray it, then I'm supposed to get it. Because He's God and I'm His child. And we'll even go to the point of almost throwing a tantrum. That God, why didn't you hear my prayer? So those are wrong concepts of God. And we have to be un understand if our concept of God is wrong from the beginning, then, then our relationship with God will be based on, on, a, uh, on something that's not real and that's not true. Tosha goes on to talk about, he says, if, if we're not careful even with God, we will get our concept of God, of who God is as a father, based on the attributes of God. Now, I know I'm a little bit deep now. It's going to get a little lighter in a minute, but I need to get this for you. Pastor Joseph likes this. He's sitting there listening like this is the kind of stuff he likes. <laughs> the attributes of God, what are they? The attributes of God. We would say, oh, God's good. No, that's the nature of God. There's an attribute of God. We, there's at least seven. Some people have even said there's more. A couple of them, God is omnipotent. Now, that's a big, beautiful word. That just means that God has all power. God has the power to do anything God wants to do, but He also has the power to not do anything He wants to do. Some people said one of the greatest uh, examples of power is to restrain that power when it needs to be restrained. He is an omnipotent God, and He has all power. Another one of His attributes is that He is omniscient. Now, that's one of those scary attributes. That means He knows everything. He knows what you thought last night. He knows what you did last week. He knows the conversations you had between different people anytime you've had them. He knows all the good things you've done. He also knows all the kind of not good things you've done. That's kind of a scary attribute because he knows me. He's omniscient. He's immutable. That's a good word. He's immutable. That means God doesn't change. The Bible says God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What's another one? God is. I've got it written down here. I'm not, he's omnipresent. That's another one I had written down. God is omnipresent. And what does that mean? That means God's everywhere. There's no place that God isn't. What is David? I think it's David that says this. He says you can go to the highest mountain and you find God there. You can make your bed down in the pits or the depths of hell and even God is there. Nowhere to the east you can go. Nowhere to the west you can go. God is omnipresent. He is all places, all times. And we don't understand that because we are finite and we can only be here. Now, let me give you this as just an idea. This, now, God, we know God is so much bigger than us, but just with, just with the technology we have right now, I can pick my phone up and I can open up a certain program. On my phone, it's called FaceTime. On yours, it can be called anything else. And I can be anywhere else in the world in just a few seconds as long as I'm connected. And I'm a human. So if you believe I can do that, and even 10 years ago or 20 years ago, none of us would have ever believed you could do that. I can be there in my face, and I can talk to my grandbabies, and they can talk to me, and we can just be right there in the same room together, even though I'm 10,000 miles away. So if you have a hard time believing the omnipotent or omnipresence of God, just think about how technology has made it. I'll get on an airplane on Thursday night, and within 20 hours, I'll be in America. Where back in the early 1900s, before air travel, it would have taken somebody four or five weeks. And then there was a time before that you couldn't even go there because nobody knew it was there. So technology brings things closer, and technology doesn't even come close to who God is. He's omnipresent. So why am I telling you all that? We need to know that about God. 
We need to know that God is all powerful, that God is all, all, uh, all omnipresent and he knows everything and he doesn't change and he's, he has, he's transcendent in his nature and, uh, and there's all kind of other big words. I can't think of them all right now. I've written them down. That don't matter. We need to understand that. But we have to understand that, but also know that this same God who created the universe and who spoke the world into existence, He also wants to live right inside of our hearts. Amen. See, that's where our relationship, and Tozer, Tozer, what he's trying to say is, even if we have a godly, biblical-based uh, uh, concept of God, but our God is this lofty, powerful, almighty, and I don't have a deep voice, I can't do this well, God. <laughs> you know, and we, some of us feel like that about God. He's God. And even when we come into His presence, and I believe this, that we have to come into His presence with holiness and with reverence and with awe. There are also times you can come into His presence. If your heart is clean, you can come in and say, Oh God, and just like my kids do with me sometimes, and jump in my lap and say, I love you, Daddy. I love you and I want to be with you. He is God. But I think it's the Apostle Paul who says, He is also Abba, Father. Amen. He's my Father God. He's my Daddy God. So He wants to be all of this. At the same time, he wants to be your father, your daddy. Now, he doesn't want to just be your daddy and not be God, but he doesn't want to be God and not be your daddy as well. See, so we've got to learn to let that concept of God, let our, our basis of who we think God is and our relationship come with God flow in that manner. All this is very important. Let me just read my notes here since I haven't looked at them yet. Uh, it, to all of us, is very important to know and understand. If we don't understand that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, all, that He is holy, then we don't have a proper concept. But we can't understand God in His fullness. The Almighty created God who made the world by speaking if we only leave Him at that place in our theological minds. The same God who created the earth, who spoke and said, let there be light. Then he spoke and the, the seas were made and the earth was separated and the mountains formed and the valleys formed and everything that is was formed. He spoke all that into existence. But that same God, at the same time he was doing that, right in the center of all that, he made a beautiful little garden. Get that in your mind. He created this whole world. He spoke it all. But he said, I'm going to make one little spot. And he said, the Bible says he called it Eden. Now that's what we call it. I don't know what the Hebrew word is. I didn't go look it up. But he made this spot. Then he came down and he said, now I want to make a man in my image and in my likeness. And this time God didn't speak. He spoke everything else into existence, didn't he? But this time, he came down to the creation that he had made. He took up a, 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 a pile of dirt from the best we can understand this whole concept of God making man. And he took this dirt and he formed out of the dirt and the clay a form, a body. It said he did it in the image and likeness of God. So maybe God has some kind of a form when he takes on the physical form. It looks like us. And that's real deep, and I'm not going to get too deep into it, but he made us in his image and likeness. So Adam, he made, and Adam looks something, well, let's, let's not say he looks like me. Maybe one of you guys that look real nice and a real trim and everything. He looks like one of you, maybe. And he made him and formed him by his hands, not speaking. And then when he had him formed, the God of the universe, the God that spoke everything into existence, he leaned over to Adam and just breathed into him. Amen. And there's nothing more intimate than that. Amen. It just doesn't get any more intimate than a God reaching over. And I don't want to get everybody all scared here or anything. I'm not going to go into something, something well, I'm going to leave that alone too. God, what's wrong with me today? Lord, help me. He breathed into him and he said he became a living being. Amen. Amen. And then God 
took this man, and he didn't just put him anywhere. He said, okay, I'm going to throw you out to this earth. He made this special little garden, and he put Adam there to tend the garden. That's the kind of relationship God intended. That's the kind of relationship God wants with us. A relationship that even in the midst of all of his power, in the midst of all of his authority, in the greatest point of his creative power that we know about, he took time to cultivate a garden that would be specific for man to live in. And then according to what we read today, we don't know this now. According to the scripture, we don't know that God came down every day. Sometimes I preached it and I said that God came down every day in the cool of the day and he would spend time with Adam. I kind of believe God did do that. But we do know on this day, God came down and it just happened to be a day. God came down and was walking in the garden. And usually from the concept, if, we can, if you give me a liberty here, he's walking in the place where he usually meets Adam, but Adam's not around. Adam's not there. And God says, where are you? That in itself shows you that God is seeking relationship. The first question God ever asked that we have recorded in the Bible is a question about relationship. Every time I come home, thank you, Edgar. Good. Edgar liked that. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Edgar, I liked it when God gave it to me too, Edgar. I liked that. I said, wow. Usually anytime I come home, I'll, I'll come in the door. I say, Shannon, I'm home. Where are you? Because I want to know where she is. I'll call my girls on the phone or my son. I say, hey, where are you? And they'll tell me where they are. Because that where are you, that one question brings us into a place of proximity, of closeness to the person that we're coming to see. And when God came into the garden, the first question ever recorded him asking, he asked, where are you? And you know what? I think he still is asking that question to us a lot of times. Amen. Some guy wrote a song a few years ago. It's a beautiful song. I tried to sing it a few times. and uh, I, I guess I did all right with it. And it was called, I Miss My Time With You. And the song says, you used to get up in the mornings and spend your time with me. But now these days you've got so busy, I miss my time with you. And I think God is constantly in His desire to have relationship with us, crying out and speaking out, where are you? Joseph, where are you? Where have you been? I've been looking for you. you you're always there when you need me, but what about when I need you? Where are you? Amen. I'm preaching myself under conviction right there. Amen. Let me just get back here to where I am. A lot of times when I, with my grandkids, and I'll be with them, and I'll get to spend about three days with my grandkids before I come back. Not enough time, but it'll be good. And sometimes when I'm with them, especially when they're small, I did it with my kids as well, we would play this game called hide and seek. You know that game? You guys know that game? Yeah. Now when you're playing it with, with, with grown-up kids, kids that get in their 10 and 12-year-old, you know, sometimes those guys can get hidden and you won't find them for days because they know how to hide. <laughs> but with a small child, a small child will be like this. They'll go hide and they'll go over and they'll stand behind something like this. Say, okay, okay, Papa, I'm ready. And you walk into the room and that's the way I do. I walk into the room and I say, now where is that Kepler at? Where is my grandson Kepler? I say, I can't find him. And I'll finally say, Kepler, I can't find you. Where are you? That's what God was doing in the garden that day. He was seeking them out. Now let me ask you this question. Do you think that what Adam and Eve did with the serpent, God didn't know? Thank you. He knew. He knew. Do you think God didn't know where they were hiding at? He knew. But he still asked the question, where are you? Where are you? He knew where they were all the time. And, and I know where my grandkids are all the time when I play hide and seek. But I never find them because I, I want them to know that I'm looking for them. But I need their help to come. 
And God could have come down and He could have exposed Adam and Eve right in the midst of their sin. He could have exposed them and brought them out in their nakedness. But He didn't do that. Because God's desire is not to expose us. It's not to, to condemn us. It's not to shame us. It's not to do any of those things. God loves us. God loves us. I love when Jesus found that woman that was caught in the act of adultery. And notice now, it didn't say that she was just an adulterer or sometimes we put her off that she was a prostitute or this or that. It said she was caught in the act of adultery and they brought her to Jesus and Jesus finally looks at her after all of her people who had condemned her walked away. He looked at her and he didn't say, you are a wretched sinner. Because you've done wrong, get out of my sight. No. He said, where are your accusers? And she looked and said, God, there's no one to accuse me. He said, I don't condemn you either. Amen. Anybody want to say, thank God he didn't condemn you? Yeah. Yeah. We got a young man a few weeks ago stood up here. He asked me to do it for him. And I told him about a sin he committed in his life. He was ashamed of that sin. Got a young lady pregnant because of it. He's ashamed of that. But he asked forgiveness of me. He asked forgiveness of God. Him and her are getting married. Somebody said to me the other day, Pastor, you mean you're going to let them get married in the church? I said, well, sure I am. God doesn't condemn them. I'm not going to condemn them. And I'd rather have them being blessed at this altar than being blessed outside somewhere. Because there's no condemnation in Him. He loves us. This is, not a, this is not a sanctimonious religious place. This is a place that whosoever will come to the, pre to the presence of God, to the altar of God. If you want a religious place, there's plenty of religious places around. Let's be a place of relationship. Let's be a place where people can come even when they have sinned and maybe their head is hung low. When they come, they find a God and says, He's saying, where are you? Amen. Amen. Now there was a result of what happened in that garden. God brought them out. God slew an animal. He covered up their sin. But they had to leave the garden. Mm -hmm. They had to flee. He couldn't let them stay in the garden anymore. He cursed the serpent. We know that is a type of Satan. And that, that, that curse that went on him was a curse on Satan. But he also cursed the ground. He cursed the woman in childbirth. He, he did all of that. And they had to leave. The worst thing of all, they had to leave the presence of God. Amen. So there is consequences. There's always reaping for your sowing. And there are consequences to all those things. But He sent them out. And I, and I need to finish this part of the message because God started with relationship. God wanted relationship. He pursued relationship. And even when He sent them out of the garden, it didn't mean relationship anymore, but God continually pursued Adam, and he continually pursued Adam's descendants even up until this time. Now, there's so many ways I can't talk about all of them, and I only have today because somebody else is picking up next week. But the way God shows us in the Old Testament that he constantly pursued mankind is by the way he used his name. He used his name in such a powerful way. In Genesis chapter 1, and I really wished I had the notes for you today for this. If I get a chance this week, I may type them up and, and send them out if, you, if anybody's interested. The first name God used for himself in the Bible that's recorded is the name Elohim. E-L-O-H-I-M. And I'm sure you pronounce that different than I do. But it's Elohim, and that's the word. That word is used more than 2,300 times in the Bible. Describing God. Many times God uses it to describe Himself. Uh, most of the time it's just the writers who are writing or describing God or using that God, that name. It's used in Genesis 1. Genesis 1, chapter 1. In the beginning God created. That's Elohim. And Elohim is not a singular name. Elohim is a plural name. It's a plural name that is talking about the one God that we have, but we know our God has plurality. He is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that first name about God, and I don't have time to get into that today, uh, but just, just take my word for it. That first name is a God that not just depicts the Father God, but it depicts the Godhead. And anytime you see Elohim, it's talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in that trinity. 
Trinity form and they're working. And anytime you see that name, that name is always referring to God the Almighty One, God the Powerful One. Sometimes the name El Shaddai, uh, that's Elohim, the beginning of El is the, the root is El, which is God. Elohim brings that plurality. El Shaddai is the Almighty God, the God who has great wonder about Him. And, and that name is used like that constantly throughout the Bible. And it is is always referring to this mighty God. And he chose, he used that name a lot when he was trying to remind people of who he was. But then he also used another name. Pastor Chris talked about it a few weeks ago, just real, real briefly in the message he was sharing with us. It was a name, sometimes it's translated Yahweh, most of the times we say it Jehovah. And that name Jehovah became this name that, that was used mostly throughout the Old Testament, actually used over 7,000 times in the Old Testament, describing Jehovah. That's the name that Moses used, or God spoke to Moses when he spoke to him and said, when you go to the children of Israel, because Moses is afraid, he says, God, how can I represent you? How can I go to them? Who do I tell them sent me? He didn't say, tell them that Elohim sent you. He said, tell them this. Tell them that Yahweh, I am who I am, has sent you. And when you go to them, this is the name that you are to give them. You are to give them the name Yahweh or the name Jehovah and tell them this will be my name throughout all generations. That's not, he, he actually says it deeper than that, doesn't he? Let me get back to the scripture. He says, this is my, uh, what does it say? This is my forever. This is my name forever. The name that you shall call me from generation to to generation. Now, and, and, and in the tradition of the Jewish people, and it even still is true today, that name is so holy, that name is so righteous to them, they won't even speak it. Even when they write it, they write it like Y-H-W-H or something, and it's there in my Bible, I don't remember what the def they won't even write it out because it's so holy. And to me, uh, this is something that the Holy Spirit kind of just dropped in my spirit yesterday. It could be wrong. Okay, I'm saying that it could be wrong, but I think it's right. I think that some of the reason they've lost relationship with God is because they're not willing to know that God wants to have relationship with them. Maybe they didn't know when His Son came is because the forever name He gave them to use, they won't even utter it. The name that he gave them that says, I am who I am. One guy translated that, not one, several people have said that name, what it, when you break it down, what it literally means is I am what you need me to be in your life. So that's when God began to use that name in a compound form. We get these names like Jehovah Jireh. See, that's a compound form of Jehovah. We get these names Jehovah Sidkenu. We get these names Jehovah Rohi. We get the name Jehovah Raha. Jehovah, I got them written down here. I can't even remember all of them. Yeah, thank you. Everybody over here is getting them for me. Jehovah Rapha, thank you. you. You knew what I was trying to say. All of those things have specific meaning. And what God, when He's revealing this name, He's revealing relationship. So when he sent Moses, now this is what I want you to get if you don't get anything else. Well, I hope you've got other things too. I don't know why I say that all the time. I want you to get everything I say, but if you don't get that, really remember this. These people had been in bondage. Anybody remember how long? 430 years. Okay. 430 years. It had been prophesied that they would be in bondage by Abraham for these, this many years. They knew the prophecy. Many of them probably had forgotten the prophecy. But now, and, and even when, when Moses went back to them, even before he left, the people were saying, God has forgotten us. God doesn't care for us. God doesn't love us. Where is God? When God sends Moses back to them, he sends them back and says, tell them that the God who wants to be in relationship with them 
is the one who's sending you. Mm -hmm. Wow, I thought that would go over a little stronger than it did, but to me, that's pretty powerful. After 430 years, God says, don't tell them that Elohim is coming. Don't tell them that you come in the name of the creative God who created the earth. Don't tell them that you came into the name of El Shaddai. Don't even tell them there's another name Adonai they use, which is, it means the Lord. A beautiful name for the Lord. He said, tell them, Yahweh, I am who I am. The God who wants to be in relationship with them has sent you. That's beautiful, guys. That's beautiful. And that same God, that same God, after over 400 years of silence, when Malachi closed out the Old Testament and he wrote his book, we didn't have this revelation from God for years and years. Some say it's 400, 450 years. Could have been less, could have been more. But the first revelation we get, God comes and he speaks through an angel to a young girl. And he says to that young girl, Behold, you have found favor with God, and you will become pregnant from God with a child. And said, so You will call his name Jesus. Amen. Jesus is another form of that word Yahweh. It's another form that means God has come. But then when he spoke to, to the angel spoke to uh, Joseph, he said, You will call his name Emmanuel. Two names that are given. We call him Jesus, but he sits in the position of Emmanuel. That God has come to be with us. And Jesus is our Lord. He is our Savior. That's what his name means. Yeshua, Jesus. It is the great, the Lord is our salvation. So the Jehovah of the Old Testament, that Jehovah name was a type of Jesus in the New Testament. So that's when he, when he spoke to Abraham on the mountain in Genesis 22. And Abraham said, Abraham, kill your son. And Abraham has his son laying on an on a altar. And he has a knife raised to hit him. He says, Abraham, stop. I am Jehovah Jireh. <laughs> or Jireh as we see it here. And I will provide the lamb for the sacrifice. Amen. And that lamb that he provided came under the name Jehovah Jireh. And that lamb pointed to the lamb that, what, seven, eight hundred years later would come mm -hmm. that hung on the tree. Mm -hmm. And he was also Jehovah, Jesus, the lamb that was provided mm -hmm. so that the son of the righteous would not be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. And you can see I could go really deep into that and we could go deeper and deeper. David was out there among his sheep. And he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What he said was, Jehovah Rohi, or some others translate it, Jehovah Ra, the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus came years later, and Jesus said, I am the good shepherd for the sheep. Amen. Amen. A guy named Philip Keller wrote a book about sheep. It's, it's called... A shepherd looks at the 23rd Psalm. You would like that book. You ought to look it up. In that, he said that, you know, there's one of the passages that says that he makes the sheep to lie down in green pastures. And this guy says that there's four things that a shepherd has to do in order for a sheep to feel comfortable to lay down. A sheep has to be free from fear. He has to be free from pest. He has to be free from strife. And he has to be free from hunger. Amen. And a good shepherd will be able to make his sheep lie down because he can cause those things to happen. He anoints their heads with a specific type of oil so that the bugs don't bite them. That's the pest. That's the devourer. That's the saint. He does things. If there's one of the sheep that's going around butting others with his head and causing problems in their flock, he'll go take that sheep. And sometimes they say he'll even break their leg. But if he doesn't, he'll separate that sheep that's causing the problems. He did what I had to do this morning before the message. You have to deal with issues. The shepherd will deal with issues sometimes. He will always take them to a place. They will never lay down if their bellies are full. Not full. He'll take them to a place where they can eat and they can get green grass. And he'll also 
What was the other one? Fear. And he, he constantly patrols them to make sure that the wolves and the animals and the, the, the devourers don't, don't come on them. That's the same thing Jesus does for us. Amen. So the same God of the Old Testament, he revealed himself when he could no longer live in the garden with his creation. He revealed himself as Jehovah. And he said, I want to be your healer. I want to be your righteousness. I want to be your deliverer. I want to be your banner when you go into war so that when you fight against your enemy, you don't fight under your name or under your power, but you fight under the name of the Lord God Almighty. Jehovah Nisi is your banner. He says, I'll be that for you. That's the kind of relationship God wants to have with us. He wants to be in relationship with his brothers and sisters. He doesn't want to serve us from afar off, but he wants to live right in our hearts but even living in our hearts, He wants us to commune with Him. Walk with Him daily like Adam walked with Him daily. So let's, let, let's make a purpose in our lives. Even this week as you're taking time to fast. Don't ever make God have to come and say, Where are you? Maybe you get up and start saying, God, I'm here. Where are you? I'm ready. And let that be your relationship with yeah. Him. Amen. Yeah. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for just letting it speak to our life. You and you alone, you know how much I've struggled with just putting this message together this week. And uh, I, I think ultimately I listened to you and, and I hope you've given a word that's started off this series well about your desire of wanting to be a relationship, relational God. And I pray, God, that every man and woman here has received this as a, a, a good rhema word into their lives. And I pray, God, that you would continually call out our names. As we've just talked about Adam and Eve, None of us ever want to be in a place where we're ashamed and we have to hide. But even when we get in that place, help us to know that you don't throw us out or you don't cast us away. But you'll come, even though you know where we are and you know what we've done, you'll come and say, where are you? I'm here. I don't want our relationship to end because of this thing. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've got some shame or some guilt in your life. Mm -hmm. Just because you've allowed some things to get into your life that, you, that don't need to be there. Maybe some attitudes, maybe some sin, maybe whatever. Why don't you right there where you're sitting? Why don't you just, in a spiritual way now, understand this is spiritual, this is not carnal. But in a spiritual way, why don't you just reveal your nakedness and your shame to God right now? Say, God, I'm sorry. I didn't want you to see me because we're naked and I'm ashamed because of what I've allowed to enter my life. Just do it right there where you are. Remember, he saw Adam out and he's seeking you out. It's not like you have to find your way back to God. You just have to acknowledge that God is there. And let him come and cover your shame with his grace. Just right there where you sit, go ahead and do that. Just say, God, here I am. He's been calling you already. <coughs> here I am, God. Forgive me. Forgive me. And thank you for clothing me in your grace. I love this one scripture in the Bible. I don't remember where it's at. It says, he's the lifter up of our heads. And that means heads that are bent and bowed in shame. He'll lift up your head so you don't have to walk in shame any longer. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. And Father, for the rest of us, now we join those who have already prayed. Father, help us to walk in right relationship with you. In a relationship that you want us to have. Not so super spiritual that 
we can't relate to anybody around us, but also not so carnal that nobody even sees Christ in our life. But that we walk in a humble, obedient, loving relationship with you. Where we treat everybody the way we would treat ourselves. Where we love our brothers and sisters, but we also love our neighbors. Where we're kind to all we can be kind to. Help us to walk in that kind of relationship. So that when people see Ron out on the street, they don't know me as Pastor Ron. They just see Ron. They'll look at me and they'll see you because I'm in such a close relationship with you. That they see you in me. There's a place in the New Testament that said that when they, it's in the book of Acts somewhere, said when they saw them, they knew that they had been with the Lord. Wouldn't that be wonderful that when people saw us, they knew we'd been with the Lord? Just walking in relationship with Him. Father, do that work among your people today. And one last thing is you got your head bowed. Maybe you're here this morning and you're out of relationship completely with the Lord. And today you'd like to give your life to Jesus. You'd like to renew your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that's you today and you want to give your life to Him, right there where you sit, all you've got to do is say this prayer. Just say, Dear Jesus, I'm sorry I'm a sinner. I'm sorry I've turned my life away from You and I don't follow You. Will you come into my life, Jesus? Will you forgive me of my sins? Today, will you restore my relationship so that I am your child again? Cleanse me and purify me from all the evil in my life. I give my life to you. Thank you Lord. And I confess with my mouth you are the Lord of my life. Now say that. If you prayed that prayer, say that. Say, you are the Lord of my life. And I believe in my heart that you truly did die for my sin, but that you also were risen from the dead. And I accept you as Savior, but I also accept you as Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.